Since its inception, the Mythbusters TV show, featuring hosts Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman, has been dedicated to testing the validity of various myths, rumors, and phenomena using scientific methods. In a recent episode, they tested an experiment to determine the outcome of shooting a grenade into the open air. What will happen when a grenade is shot? Which type of ammunition is capable of detonating a grenade? Join us as we uncover the Mythbusters findings on this explosive topic. The best rifle to shoot a grenade in the air. Now, when it comes to shooting objects out in midair, it's a sport called trap shooting or skeet shooting. In this episode, both Adam and Jamie are trying to see if they can shoot a grenade in the air. In a bid to do that, they have to get to the Bay Area. So they travel to the Coyote Valley Sporting Clays to meet Dave Ray Duke, who will be their teacher. Dave has been an instructor in the sport for 16 years, and he will be teaching specially on how to rid the world of clay pigeons. Adam said it would be an understatement to say they've fired a lot of guns in the course of doing the show. Over the years, they've fired pistols, rifles, and cannons ons from moving cars at moving cars and even at other bullets. But this time they're trying to hit a moving target in midair. They want to train in clay pigeons so that hopefully they can hit a grenade, but their training isn't coming easy. If they can't even hit a moving target, then the myth falls at the first hurdle. Adam said it's not as easy as Hollywood would have us believe. I'm a little behind, but have got a great teacher. Dave pointed out that they've been shooting at the clays from the side, but in trying to hit a grenade, they have to be more concerned when they're coming at them. Adam replied that he understood and shot appropriately. He admitted that the more realistic incoming trajectory is a lot easier for him. And so far, the myth is moving in the right direction. Jamie said to celebrate their newly found skills, he was going to go over behind a building, toss his beret out, and see if Adam could hit it. Adam was quite excited by the offer and he was able to hit it. He said he would want to keep the beret and mount it in his trophy case. Jamie asked what he would wear, and Adam replied that they would have to get him another beret. Back to the grenades. Adam said it is pretty small compared to some of the things they've blown up over the history of Mythbusters. But these grenades are incredibly dangerous and have all of us in our bomb techs quite nervous. So to properly experiment, we have come to a large tract of private land in Gold Country, east of the Mythbusters shop, where we have thousands of acres of clear land all around us. Adam added that countless times on the show, they have armoured themselves behind some blast chamber panels to watch dangerous things happen, hopefully right on the other side. The setup where their blast chamber panel is bordered on both sides by inch-thick plates of steel. This is the most armoured they are required to be in the field because it's not just an explosive pressure wave they're dealing with. The steel body of the grenade is designed to spray lethal fragments at over 25,000 feet per second in every direction. To be able to move objects and see how the process is going to be from the safety of the bunker, Jamie made a small baby moving truck. While explaining the body parts, he said the bomb disposal robots cost around 100 grand and the control truck is about $200. He included some servos for arms, a baby head and a camera. After setting safety precautions, a control and a time fuse, it's time for them to shoot. Jamie did the test shooting and Adam admitted it was quite an intense moment. He added that the key reason for the test was to check their timing because they needed to know how much time it takes for the grenade to go off once the spoon popped up. The camera captured five seconds exactly. Much later, Adam stated that they were just about to start firing guns at the grenade and they've been thinking about it and they thought one of three things is going to happen for each of the shots. It's been established that an oncoming grenade can be taken out. These are the weapons we'll be using on the grenade today and we'll be firing four kinds of ammunition out of these three weapons. We've got a 308 round, a 45 caliber pistol round and a 12 gauge double aught buck round. Still, on their kinds of ammunition, Jamie added that he thinks 308 rounds is going to be by fast the most effective round against the grenade, but its rifle is by far the most difficult one to hit a grenade in mid-air with. While at the other end of the spectrum, we've got the shotgun used for trap shooting, the easiest weapon to use to hit a grenade in mid-air. Adam cuts in to say that he thinks the double lot buck round will be least effective against the grenade but they are starting their shooting with the shotgun and the lightweight buckshot. After the shooting, 
they found out that the grenade's delay side was remotely triggered. Adam fired the shotgun, and the grenade knocked the stand. But there was no explosion, so they thought the live grenade was somewhere in the shooting area. Since they can't leave the bunker till they deal with the situation, they decide to fire up the baby bomb machine. Before they fire up the bomb baby, Adam fires up the high-speed camera. Then they went out of the bunker to take a lot, and they found out that there were no grenades but dust. They affirmed that it's quite unbelievable, but one can shoot a live grenade and render it inert. They found out it was done in five seconds, but the cap didn't explode. So the double bought to buck round completely disintegrated the grenade. It was quite surprising because the ammunition has little 38 caliber lead balls, and one wouldn't think it would be able to do a whole lot to a steel grenade, but it did. Next up is a 45 caliber round pointed at the grenade, though they had discovered that it's a lot harder to hit a missed grenade with the rifle than it is with one of those easy shotgun rounds. Adam expects it to have a very similar effect as the double aught buck, while Jamie thinks the 45 caliber will turn the grenade into dust. After the shooting, Jamie pointed out that the rifle shot the grenade right off the stand. The cap went off, but the grenade didn't. He said we knocked the grenade off the stand. Looks like we spilled it in half. So we didn't stop the cap from going off, but we did stop the grenade from blowing up. Adam remarked that it was very cool. Compared to the buckshot, the 45mm round removed the blasting cap with surgical precision. Either way, it's another myth confirming the result. So next we're going to bring some real energy to the equation by using a 308 sniper round, full metal jacket. In predicting what the ammunition will do to the grenade, Adam admitted he had been wrong in his previous guesses, so he is going to say he has no idea this time. After the shooting, they found out that the grenade went boom, though not disintegrated. Looking at the high-speed camera, the scalpel, the microscope, light, and the multi-tool for tackling time. It shows that the grenade ignited the second it was shot. However, Adam pointed out that the blasting cap inside a grenade is somewhat shock sensitive, while the 398 round is a very high speed round. The speed translates directly to a certain amount of energy being brought to the equation. But for this experiment, the very instant the rifle touched the exterior of the grenade, the shock caused the entire thing to detonate early. It's a powerful and instant reaction. Adam explained that the experiment is the second of three potential results and the most common of the cinematic techniques, the mid-air explosion. He also pointed out that if the grenade was ignited at any closer range than 45 feet, which is the kill zone for a grenade, it will cause a loss of life. And further than 45 feet, it will become almost impossible to make such a shot like that. Jamie agrees to his assertions that in theory it's possible, but he would have a duck if such a scenario played out. Adam said if Jamie ducked, it could work. So, to recap their final result, the high-powered rounds, the 308 detonated the grenade, which means that if it's within 50 feet, it will also lead to murder. But the low-powered rounds, the 45 calibers, and especially the shotgun, both rendered the grenades inert and the shotguns kept the blasting cap from going off, which was the exact opposite of their expectations for the episode. Three popular beliefs about grenades were tested in this next episode. What are these general beliefs, and how will they turn out? Can jumping on grenades hurt your comrades? In this segment, lots of popular beliefs are put to the test. The first one tests whether jumping on a grenade can hurt your comrades. A human model made of ballistics gelatin was used for this experiment. The model was placed on top of the grenade, which was then remotely detonated. The damage caused by this explosion was then compared to that of a baseline, which was established with no constraints on the grenade. The experiment also tested whether submerging the grenade in a bucket of water could reduce the damage caused by the explosion. This was confirmed as the damage was considerably less than the baseline. The final belief tested was whether placing the grenade in a refrigerator could help. This belief was debunked as parts of the refrigerator destroyed the stand-ins on both the front and back, although those on the side were relatively unharmed. At another time, they tackle another myth. The belief tested was whether self-hypnosis is effective. Adam, Carrie and Grant each tried a self-hypnosis method to test this belief. Adam tried to overcome his fear of bees. 
Grant attempted to cure his seasickness, and Carrie tried to change her eye color. For Adam, two methods were used to track his fear, pulse rate and a galvanometer. For Carrie, before and after pictures of her eyes were taken. For Grant, the chunk chair was used to stimulate seasicknesses. Being prone to seasickness, Grant offered to try self-hypnosis to see if he could get over his illness. He was placed in a chair designed to make people seasick as a control, and Tori and Kari monitored how long it took him to throw up. Grant then tried using a self-hypnosis CD to get better. Grant returned to the chair after his self-hypnosis session, but his illness still took twice as long to take effect. Initially, Kari visited an eye center to get a control picture of her eye color. The next step was a self-hypnosis session, where she tried to alter the color of her eyes. She returned to the eye center to have her eyes examined, though, and the findings indicated that her eye color had not changed. Tori didn't have any problems that could be solved by self-hypnosis, so Adam was brought in by the build team to try and help him overcome his unreasonable fear of bees. In the control test, Adam was shown a box full of bees and required to put his hand inside of it. This allowed them to measure his heart rate and his level of physical stress. Adam retook the test following his self-hypnosis session. Adam demonstrated the same levels of physical stress and fear during the retest, indicating that his fear persisted. The only difference between any of the tests was that Grant took a bit longer to succumb to seasickness. The result of the experiment was that the belief was debunked. The third belief tested was whether drinking Diet Coke and eating Mentos would cause your stomach to explode. To test this belief, a pig stomach was used as a substitute for a human stomach. The pig stomach was drained and an acid mixture was added to make it have the same pH level as a stomach that had just eaten food. When Diet Coke and Mentos were added to the stomach, nothing happened. The experiment then tested two possible reasons for the lack of reaction. The method of pouring the Diet Coke and the acidity of the stomach. Further testing showed that it was the pouring method that was causing the lack of reaction. When they tried pouring it slower, the carbon dioxide was still released too early, causing a minimal reaction when the Mentos were added. Similar to the previous myth involving soda and pop rocks, the stomach expanded to the point where the victim would be in excruciating pain and induce vomiting. Even if the gas from a regular Mentos or cola fountain was pumped straight into the stomach. It only burst when compressed air was blasted straight into the stomach. In the end, the belief was debunked, but the team still wanted to explode the stomach, so they pumped it full of compressed air until it ruptured. The Mythbusters set off a grenade in the control test, surrounded by multiple plywood dummies at different distances, and there were no obstacles in the way. Most of the dummies suffered fatal injuries from the shrapnel. To conduct the test, Adam and Jamie covered the grenade with a ballistics gel dummy before setting it off. Only one plywood dummy sustained significant damage, and that damage was not fatal. Whereas the ballistics gel dummy was destroyed, the hero would surely perish in the attempt, but he would be able to save his allies in the vicinity. After Adam and Jamie proceed to bust another myth, they hope that by submerging a grenade in a bucket of water, the shrapnel would be slowed down enough to avoid hitting the plywood dummies. There were worries, though, that the bucket itself would become shrapnel and add to the damage. Even though there was only one dead dummy after the test, there was still a lot less shrapnel damage than in the control test. This approach has the benefit of not requiring the hero to make a self-sacrificing choice, despite its flaws. A refrigerator was brought in and positioned in the center of the group of dummies by the Mythbusters. After that, they inserted a grenade inside of it and set it off. The refrigerator was effectively transformed into an enormous fragmentation grenade, and the dummies directly in front of and behind it were destroyed by the flying debris, though it was safe to stand at the sides. It was unanimous among the Mythbusters that it was a bad idea to place a grenade inside the refrigerator. With a series of tests on handling grenades and belief surrounding it, the Mythbusters decide to test a grenade with a car. Is a grenade powerful enough to blow up a car? What is the operation behind it? Can a real grenade blow up a car? An episode of Mythbusters examined the typical movie scene in which a vehicle is struck by a rocket-propelled grenade. Usually, 
the car will topple over in a very dramatic manner due to the RPG explosion and impact. An actual RPG struck an SUV, causing it to explode, but the car remained largely motionless. They used some movie special effects, fuel for a bright explosion, and a piston to push the car over, to get the car to flip on impact. Why then does the RPG not flip the car? To find out why the RPG didn't flip the car, we'll dive a bit into physics. Creating the simplest possible solution to a problem is an exciting physics task. The SUV in the RPG SUV collision didn't even truly flinch away from the impact. An automobile won't topple over if it doesn't revert. From experts' view, the grenade will have significantly more power if it lands inside the vehicle. Since the explosion will be equally contained, it will affect human lungs and anything softer than windows. The car won't explode, but everything inside will be destroyed by the shrapnel. The car's exterior components, such as the tires, fuel system and engine, should mostly survive. The shrapnel will tear tires, engines, fuel lines and other parts of the car if it falls beneath it. The explosion will be directed out the sides of the car and away from the vehicle itself. It will spout gas like crazy, but the grenade will keep it from igniting. Being an explosive weapon used in war, it's rarely seen being held by hands for a longer time. Mythbusters decided to replicate a movie scene where it was held and see how long they could hold it for. Holding a grenade. A dangerous experiment. The episode starts with Adam telling Jamie to get a grip. He said that is the name of the story that we're doing. There is a television show called The Bridge, and on this show, a bad guy took a mother with her kids and locked them in a shed. But before he locked them inside, he handed the mum a live grenade so that she could hold on to it knowing that her ability to hold on to it was her only line between life and certain death. After a couple of hours, she can barely hold on any longer, her forearms all cramped, and she's just about to let go when the hero shows up and saves the day. But here's the question. Is holding on to a grenade really that difficult? Well, I hope when we go to test this, we can use an inert grenade. Jamie replied, Do you mind if I put something a little extra in there? A little surprise, maybe something to raise the stakes just a little. And Adam agreed. Adam pointed out that they were going to conduct this experiment in an experiment conducting kind of place. Good enough. A room in which he will be locked for a couple of hours to see how well he can hold on to a grenade to try to replicate the pressure the woman in the clip was feeling. Jamie said, I think it's important that our genuine grenade is not completely inert. So I've rigged a little consequence for Adam. If he lets go, both Jamie and Adam are trying to make sure that everything matches the clip, including a nice outfit. Adam stated, Well, never let it be said I'm not willing to go the extra mile for science. And with that, it's time to go. In the television show, the woman had to hold on to the grenade for about two hours. Adam observed that so far it doesn't feel so bad. I've been holding this grip so long that I actually can feel that my fingers are a little bit weaker. I can feel the spring of the spoon wanting to push my fingers outwards. That is interesting and not a little scary. The reason Adam is struggling is down to cramps. Because the muscles in his forearm and wrist have been contracting for more than an hour. The chemical balance inside is out of whack, which causes the muscles to contract more than normal. Now, not only is that painful, but it means that Adam is not in full control over what his arm is doing. It's not long before time's up. There it is. Two hours, I'm still alive. Furthermore, Adam said he could easily go for probably a couple more hours, at least before, and if he had known, he would have switched hands, so he would get another four hours. He added, I was thinking, why take the risk of getting cramps at all? I don't love this. I don't love it. It's too wide. I mean, this woman had access to all sorts of stuff. My pantyhose, stuff she could have used to tie down the spoon of the grenade. Jamie said he only had to sacrifice his dignity to make it happen. With the grenade bound and gagged, there's no chance of a boom until Adam takes one for the team. After a while, Adam said he's also kind of curious about what's going to happen. They later concluded that the myth that one can't hold on to a grenade for longer than two hours is busted. Diving over a grenade has been believed to be a dangerous action, especially as painted in movies. But is it true? Is the myth true or false? Stuntmen to prove real grenade. 
Jamie and Adam are testing the movie myth that says diving into a grenade will smother the blast and save your buddies. But with the neighbors likely to gripe about a grenade going off in the backyard, the team heads for one of their favorite spots. Adam said to blow up grenades, you got to go to a place where they blow up grenades, like the Alameda County Sheriff's Department's bomb rates, which is where they will be experimenting. The place is a veritable mythbuster mecca, and Jamie and Adam decide to shoot some cannons. In the pirate special, Redbeard and Captain Heidemann tested the myth that cannonball splinters are more deadly than cannonballs. But this time, the guys are going gung-ho with grenades. And the Mythbusters turn to some old friends, Frank Doyle and J.D. Nelson, for the crucial explosive ingredients. But first, Adam can't resist testing a mini-myth. He asked, So the thing I've always wondered is, can you pull these out with your teeth? It works in the movies, but how about real life? I don't think so. Why would you do this when you had a perfectly good finger right over here? It requires over 10 pounds of pressure to pull a grenade pin. So this myth is busted, a bit like Adam's teeth. Seeing as Jamie and Adam's expertise in this field comes from the movies, their friend decides to teach them about grenades from the basics. A hand grenade is a small, handheld explosive device that's meant to be thrown, and after a certain delay it goes off. The pin comes out first, which releases the striker lever, hits the percussion cap, and sets off the chemical fuse. Finally, the detonator sparks the packed explosive material. There's a big boom, and the metal casing fragments into deadly shrapnel. Jamie asks that if the M67 is going to be the grenade today, do we get to pull the pin and throw them? Frank replied that they won't be doing that today for safety reasons. We'll have a very controlled situation. And I think it's a good time for JD and myself to go and prepare the actual grenades that we're going to use today. In talking to Jamie, Adam said while control freaks Frank and JD set up a remote firing system, let's start assembly lining this thing, it's time to call for our movie extras. But our leading man can kick back at his trailer as this test is the control. We are going to detonate one of our grenades without anything inhibiting it. We're going to see what it does to our figures standing around it. Then we'll have a baseline comparison of damage to compare all the other subsequent tests too. As the director of this slice of the movie Mayhem, Adam choreographs his stuntmen. I am standing at the exact location where we're going to be detonating our series of grenade tests. The grenade is lethal within 15 feet and can cause injuries within 40 to 45 feet. The actors are placed at five foot intervals from the blast epicenter. And with everyone poised for action, JD brings the small package with the big boom. With the live grenade in position, the experts clear the area and begin their preparation. Adam said they are going to be putting a blasting cap into the body of the grenade, aiding the explosive, running it by hard wire, all the way back to the fire control point where we will do the button pushing and initiate the explosion. The shot was quite intense, just like Jamie expected it to be and the effect was seen on the figures set up at different feet away and on the thick glass that was used to shield the camera. It shows that the grenade used was real. What do you think about these myths? Do you believe in them? Leave your thoughts in the comments section. While at it, also like, share and subscribe for more exciting stories.